Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for November 14th, 2021 for Riverside United Church, an affirming community of faith in London, Ontario. My name is Dave Exley, and I'm the lead minister for Riverside, and I hope you feel a sense of God's presence with you today through the music that we share, through the words that we offer up, through the images that you see. May they lift you up today and give you hope. We continue our sermon series for the month of November, More Than Enough, living with a sense of abundance, not scarcity. For this week three of the sermon series, we'll explore an interesting passage from Mark chapter 13 as we consider Jesus' challenging words related to the destruction of the temple. These are words that can provide help and hope for us today, most especially in the midst of the darkness that we see within our world. In our struggles, in our trials, Jesus' words can help us navigate our way through those difficult times to a better, more hopeful place. I want to remind you, as we've done in, in many previous weeks, if you'd like to donate to the ministry of Riverside United Church, there are a number of different ways that you can do that. You go on to our website to riverside.on.ca, click on the Donate Online button, and you'll see a list of options there for you if you'd like to contribute to our ministry as we provide help and hope for our community and the wider world. But as we begin this service today, may God lift you up through the words that we share in this song that we sing as we open our service today. Mark 13, verse 1 to 8. I'm reading from Common English Bible. As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name, saying, I am the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of sufferings associated with the end. 
hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And friends, let us pray. O creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word. Open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, a former denominational leader had an interesting idea when he stepped into a key leadership role many years ago. Why don't we invite a dozen congregations, he said, from across the country to close the doors of their church buildings for one year and see what ministry might look like without a building. It was a wonderful idea. Unfortunately, the idea never got off the ground. It was just too radical for other church leaders, key leaders in the church to embrace. And so the church kept moving forward as usual, or more accurately, the church for the most part remained the same. When someone shared that story with me a few years ago, I couldn't help but think of this passage of scripture from Mark chapter 13. For just like the first followers of Jesus, we can sometimes find ourselves lost in things like buildings and stuff. So much so that we lose sight of the most critical aspects of our faith tradition. Mark chapter 13 begins with the disciples mesmerized by the grandeur of the temple. They are in awe. What awesome stones and buildings, they say to Jesus. And immediately, he bursts their bubble. Do you see these enormous buildings, he says? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Talk about a killjoy. This is where some context is important when we read this passage of Scripture. For we need to remember what came before it. Remember where we left off last week in the Gospel of Mark? The tail end of chapter 12, just before this section of the text? In that passage we read last week, Jesus notices this poor widow at the temple being reduced to nothing by the religious system. He witnesses the hypocrisy of the religious establishment, and he shares his frustration and anger with the disciples. In the very next moment, the disciples have forgotten all about the woman and the hypocrisy on display. They find themselves spellbound by the beauty of the stones and the building. Any thought of the widow and the pain she's experienced, any empathy they may have had for her, once well, quickly disappeared. And so it's no wonder that Jesus bursts their bubble so quickly. He might as well have said to them, you just witnessed a woman being destroyed, being devoured, knocked down by the establishment, and you've already forgotten about her? I wonder if Jesus, in this moment, can't help but think that the temple, with those awesome stones and rocks, is the very thing preventing people from seeing what's most important, from seeing one another and the value of human life. The temple had just become another idol to the people, and we know what God thinks of idol worship. The comment from the disciples leads to Jesus' longest sermon in the Gospel of Mark, and what he shares hardly seems like good news. It's an apocalyptic message. He talks of conflict, betrayal, darkness, and despair. It's anything but music to the ears of the faithful. Pain is something that we, we most often would soon rather avoid. But Jesus, like a good physician, knows that pain is sometimes necessary if we want to bring healing and, and wholeness to the world. The New Revised Standard Translation for this passage ends with an interesting image. Jesus says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. And then he closes with these words. 
This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. It's a helpful image, particularly for those that know and have experienced childbirth. I can remember when my first, when my wife first experienced birth pangs. I thought I was ready for that moment. I did have the easy job that day. We had attended a series of birthing classes with other couples. The instructors prepped us well. On the day of our first, on the day our first child was born, I had my bag full of items recommended by our birthing coaches. As the one not going through those birth pangs, I could bring peace and calm to the situation. I could provide comfort amidst the storm. And so when the, the heavy contractions started, I pulled out all the tools I needed to massage and bring comfort to my pregnant wife. I was ready for this moment, and so I sprung into action. Then, before I could get within six inches of her, Betsy, my wife, stretched her arm out to stop me and said in a tone that I had not heard from her before, Don't touch me. I backed off and sat down. I couldn't help but in that moment feel a little worthless, worried that I had failed as a partner. It was an unexpected turn of events, something that was definitely not on the birthing class curriculum. As a result, I, I just sat down and did my best to, to send good vibes to my wife telepathically even though I was worried that, that she would tell me to stop that as well. I found out that day that birth pangs are, are nothing to mess with. I also discovered that I was an amateur when it comes to childbirth. Even with all the preparation that I had before that faithful day, there was still so much that I did not know. I gained a new perspective for pain, a new respect for mothers. I also realized that pain and suffering can sometimes lead to the most beautiful and wonderful things in this world. Even though my wife wouldn't let me touch her at, in that moment of pain early in the day, I was able to touch something precious at the end of the day, my newborn daughter. In that moment, all the concerns associated with that chaotic stretch of time from earlier in the day faded way. I can't think of a better image when it comes to the church in our world. We can sometimes get swept up and lost in those painful moments that life throws at us. We would soon rather numb out, avoid moments where we're uncomfortable, moments where we feel like amateurs. But we're reminded that there is something beautiful on the other side of our pain and our discomfort. Jesus dreamed of giving birth to a new world, a world that moved past mere stones and rocks and ushered in something new and beautiful. He dreamed of co-creating a world where all would be held in the loving arms of God rather than being knocked down by the corrupt and misguided systems of our world. In many ways, Jesus does step into that birthing, mothering role. For the pain that he endured on the cross was pain that was rooted in love and a deep desire to give birth to something new and beautiful in our world. When we partner with Jesus in this work, we can sometimes feel like that hopeless amateur, that father-to-be in the birthing room years ago. Just when we think we have it all figured out, we realize that there's so much more to know. But if we walk faithfully beside him, something beautiful will be waiting for us on the other side of the troubling apocalypses we experience in our world. These past 20 months or so have felt a little apocalyptic for our society and for the church as we've attempted to navigate through this time of pandemic. In many ways, we've been forced to learn what ministry without a building looks like. That idea that was left on the cutting room floor of our denominational headquarters found its way to every community of faith in Canada 
and the rest of most of the world. It's been a time of trial where we've seen deceivers and false prophets emerge. We've experienced moments of division and disunity, all those things that Jesus addresses in Mark 13. The good news is that Jesus doesn't say, these are signs of the end, period. He doesn't simply long for chaos and a final concluding moment for the world. He says, these things are just the beginning of the suffering associated with the end. How is this good news? It's good news because Jesus is inviting us to join him. Join him in the work of bringing an end to suffering. An end to injustice. An end to poverty. An end to homelessness. An end to hopelessness and hate. An end to war and division. He's inviting us to see a way out of those things. And a way into something new. A new beginning. It won't come without pain or suffering. Much of that is just a day-to-day -day reality when it comes to our living. But at the end will be something beautiful. A new beginning filled with light and love. The only way we'll get to that new beginning is to admit that there is more to know. Around every corner on the road of life, there is something new to learn. The great Catholic monk and mystic Meister Eckhart once wrote these powerful words that connect so well with this concept. He wrote this. It is your destiny to see as God sees, to know as God knows, to feel as God feels. How is this possible? How? Because divine love cannot defy its very self. Divine love will be eternally true to its own being, and its being is giving all it can at the perfect moment. And the greatest gift God can give is God's own experience. Every object, every creature, every man, woman, and child has a soul, and it is the destiny of all to see as God sees, to know as God knows, to feel as God feels to be as God is. Individually, we cannot see as God sees, but working together, we can achieve that goal. If we join with one another and walk in the way of Christ, our eyes will open to new possibilities, to new beginnings. And someday we'll step back and we'll look upon all we've achieved as co-creators with God. And rather than merely say, Teacher, what, look what awesome stones and buildings. We will say, Teacher, look what great love we've shared. Look at the hope we've offered. Look at the healing we've done together. Partnered with God and with one another, we have more than enough to arrive at that more hopeful tomorrow. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. delivered me from my
And friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Go in the name of the one who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer, who goes with us this day and all our days. Go in peace. Amen.